Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Any signs of life? Negative. Have you tried all hailing frequencies? Affirmative. No answer from the cube. Have the department heads meet me on the bridge. Already standing by. Life sciences. Same report. So are we going to just let it hold us here? We've got phaser weapons. I vote we blast it. I'll keep that in mind, Mr. Bailey. When this becomes a democracy. You realize that the aim will, of course, be very crude. I don't care if you hit the broadside of a barn. Just hurry, please. Captain, why should I aim at such a structure? Never mind, Spock. Just get on with the job. <laughs> There is an inexorable force in the cosmos where time and space converge. A place beyond man's vision, but not his reach. It is the most mysterious and awesome point in the universe. Where the here and now may be forever. It is unavoidable through space, swallowing everything in its path, radio waves, light, even planets and stars. That madman is headed straight for the black hole. What will we do? The time is 1893, and novelist and inventor H.G. Wells invites you to join him on a flight from London to San Francisco. In under a minute, you will be transported to a bizarre and fantastic new age. Today, time after time. Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to This Week in Geek.net's Future Imperfect. I am your lieutenant commander because, hey, I'm definitely not to be trusted to drive this ship, but I am Mike the Bourbon. I'm joined with my fellow crewmates from across the cosmos on the Palomino and a time machine tonight i'm joined by my compatriot my brother from the lovely city of kitchener ontario canada uh alex the producer and the only guy i would trust to drive me anywhere with a space vehicle from the lovely city of lansing michigan i'm aaron pollier all right guys so we are back here on future and permit night this is one of our first shows of 2024 where we're going to talk about some hardcore sci-fi we're going to do some track later on alex picked these two movies uh for us to talk about tonight one of them i really enjoyed one of them I don't mind aspects of it, but I know that opinion is going to be very, very different tonight. So the two movies we're going to be talking about tonight was a Disney quote unquote classic by some called the black hole. And that came out in 1979. And then we're going to talk about a Warner brothers movie that I had heard about through Avengers end game. And I didn't know what it was about until Alex and Aaron told me about it a couple of weeks ago. And that is the Malcolm McDowell movie with David Warner called Time After Time. And I've had to watch The Black Hole two or three times to get what the hell was going on. Um, and there are parts about this movie I really, really enjoy. So I'm going to kind of talk about my memories first, and then I'm going to go around the table. So I was born in 1981. So this movie came just before my time. But I seem to remember, <clears throat> excuse me, growing up at my local elementary school, they used to have books on tape or books on record. And I seem to recall listening to the black hole on record or cassette. I can't remember what format it was in, but I do remember a very high quality picture book that you could read along to the story with, with like sound effects and, you know, music cues and all that stuff. I'm pretty sure I'm remembering that right, but I seem to remember a lot of the robot designs from this movie, specifically with Bob and with Vincent and with Max, uh, who are the hero robots in this. I also didn't realize that um, Vincent was voiced by Roddy McDowell, who I know him most famously in my life as the, the priest from Fright Night, but also the Mad Hatter from Batman the Animated Series. That's what you know him from? 
Uh, yeah, oh, like man. I don't know his like kind of work outside of those things because my experience he's is very, very the limited. Apes. I was gonna say like, he's I've, a, I've, I've I've never seen those. You've never seen any of the. Oh Planet my god! I saw maybe the I saw maybe the first one when I was very 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 young. And okay, we we will rectify that. Uh, that will be yes. rectified very I mean, very soon. Uh, <laughs> most of them are crap. The first uh, one is amazing. First, First one's amazing. The second one was clearly meant to be the end. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then they uh, just kept milking it. And then it eventually devolves into madness. And then the final film in that franchise uh, is basically the premise of the last two modern movies. Okay. And it's depressing. Like, um, it gets yeah. increasingly depressing, in my opinion. Um, and, and post-apocalyptic. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, I mean, it's already post-apocalyptic at the beginning. I'm just saying that, like, it gets increasingly... Yeah, yeah, like... Yeah. W without spoiling anything, Michael, the second movie is about survivors that have lost all faith in all religions except worshipping a nuclear bomb. bomb. Yeah, that's the only part of it I really know, plus some of them... It's weird. I know a lot about Planet of the Apes merchandise like when it comes to the toys the migos and all that shit for some reason i so, know a lot about that don't know why so um, was, was was your first ape movie the tim burton one then yes actually oh, actually no i'm gonna say something terrible but why not my first exposure to the planet of the apes was actually the adult film called planet of the babes <laughs> with uh asia Carrere and Actually, kind of thought parts of that were actually kind of cool outside of the, you know, sexy Asian lady doing cool stuff. Um, I thought you were going to say something different. I thought you were going to say your only exposure to the Planet of the Apes was uh, when the they made it into, into, into a musical on The Simpsons. Or, or like, one yeah, a, car oh, a cartoon yeah. or something. Dr. Yeah. Say is, Dr. Say is. Some weird European yeah. cartoon yeah. version of it. Oh. I don't know. Oh, that could be, which is yeah. worse. <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah. basically how it goes, Michael, before going off too far off track, yeah. original Planet of the Apes, um, when it came out, because it was also pre-2001, uh, mm -hmm. right? It was, I believe, at the time, considered, like, one of the best science fiction. Like, they had a highest budget, at least, yeah. in the time period. Charlton Heston was, like, the number one actor in the world. Like, they mm -hmm. had, like, the best top-tier people. It, in today's standards, like, comparatively, it's probably, like, an 8 or 9 out of 10. It yeah, still holds okay. up. Oh, wow. And then the second one, hard fall-off. Uh, the third one is... Uh, basically they went from serious movie with serious music to by the third and fourth movies using like uh ben, ben, benny hill music you know like, oh. like that's basically what it became oh that's so sad um and then i guess my final memories of the black hole I remember some of the toys and for some reason i would often run into maximilian which is the big fuck you robot that's uh, by Dr. I can't even remember Reinhardt. his name. Reinhardt. The bad guy. Do Dr. E yeah. Dr. Evil German Evil. <laughs> yeah, so by uh, Dr. Reinhardt. I seem to recall seeing a lot of those toys in thrift stores kind of growing up. And most recently, I remember, because I used to be a member of the Disney Movie Club up until they discontinued that in Canada last year, the black hole was exclusive to the Disney movie club. You couldn't buy it in stores. You could only order it online. Never did. Kind of glad I didn't buy it. Um, and yet my next door neighbor, Liam loves this movie because he like kind of grew up on this. This was his jam uh, kind of growing up. And like I said, I had to watch this movie two or three times to kind of get what was going, going on in this. Like I said, parts of this I loved, parts of this I really fucking hated. But uh, yeah, so I will go to Alex next, and then we'll finish up with Aaron. What okay. are your initial memories? Um, I remember seeing posters of this, and I remember it being referenced in like other shows and movies, uh, almost like the butt of a joke. I, I might be wrong, but because you're the expert, Michael, when it comes to X-Files. But was it not one of the things that was made fun of by the lone gunman at one point when they're like mm -hmm. referencing? I remember distinctly them referencing and making and like on the show, like talk about being trolls on that show, trolling. Uh, was it the TV show Earth Two? Yeah, on, yeah, on, yeah, on, yeah. on forums and there, and I feel like this was one of the posters they had in the background or one of the things. And I, I don't remember really ever seeing it except for bits and pieces. I feel like Maximilian was reused in other things. 
Um, I would kind of wonder, actually. Like it has, it could just be like uh, like a Mandela effect where I'm seeing it and I'm thinking, you know, Buck Rogers or something. But it it I know I it was really problematic for me watching it now as a whole and being like, oh, this is they were clearly trying to be like Star Trek in tone of trying to be like a more grounded science fiction where it's a little slower moving, but they were also clearly trying to capitalize on star Wars. And, mm -hmm. and then also at the same time as that, they're trying to like blend in the Disneyified, you know, goofy characters and things that they would normally have in like the computer wore tennis shoes or, or any of like Herbie movies. It, it's a blending of all that. And then for some reason, I, I mentioned it to you guys that like by sending it in a chat, it's almost like there's, a sheen of like a filmation or like the Sid and Marty Croft productions in it. There's something just odd about it. And you can see that Disney spent a fair bit of money on sets more than anything and everything and, and good actors. Like this is one of those movies where they filled it with great actors that had nothing to do except speak terrible dialogue that had no research behind it or, thought behind it it sounds like whoever wrote the script went what are the hot button issues of the 70s what are, what are the titles of of uh articles in science magazines right now i won't do any research but i'm going to read what this what the concept is and then go okay let's put a bunch of buzzwords in this and make up the pseudoscience so, so that we think it makes sense but anybody even contemporary at the time would go that doesn't make any sense so mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's not a case of like, if, if this dialogue and the script had been in the fifties, I would, I would have gone, okay, the general oh, public man. might believe this. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. Okay, you know what yeah, I'm saying? I, I can, I can I, maybe I, I give my, my, my thoughts on this, but I'll let you finish Alex. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah. I didn't mean the, like the science public. I'm saying the general public watching it might go okay, maybe this belief they can, you know, put it to the side. But by nearly 1980, this was like, you know, as long as this had come out before, let's say, Star Trek or any realistic, somewhat realistic, somewhat science-driven science fiction show, like maybe in the 40s, late 40s, early 50s, it would have been fine. But this has quite possibly the worst script for a science fiction film per, uh, portray, portraying or trying to portray a hard sci-fi. They were trying to portray like, this is a hard science fiction movie for children and then yeah. completely drop the ball. So uh, maybe I should touch touch on like my, my memories. Right. Okay, yeah. I think I'm right. older than both yes. of you, right? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm born in eight. I'm 87. I'm, okay. I'm the, so, the 90s so, baby, technically. So yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I was I'm already 81. alive by a couple years when this came out. Um, I I remember it. I actually remember seeing it in the theater. I think I do. I think I do. But that oh, could wow. be like a false memory. I, I do remember having this on Betamax in my house. That would make sense. Disney and, did a fair bit of Betamax releases, so you could have also yeah. seen it on one of those. Uh, like you remember Disney back in the day, before they put a lot of videos on home video, they would do the matinees for kids, where it was like fifty cents or a dollar on a, on a Sunday yeah. or Saturday to go see something, right? So it could have you could have been early it, '80s it and you went possible. and saw it, it on a matinee. Because I do remember my my earliest memory, my earliest true memory is actually seeing Star Trek: The Motion Picture in the in, in a drive-in theater with my parents, and and so yeah. Yeah, oh, it wow. is because I remember the That's a good one to have. scene like perfectly. But, but 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 back back to back to black hole. I grew up watching this, and and believe it or not, I never thought of it as science fiction. Absolutely never thought of it as science fiction, and I always thought of it as a fantasy film. And maybe. Maybe that's why I'm coming see at this like I, I've come at it from a different direction. Like I yes, the plot and the dialogue is just nonsense. It's nonsense. Um, you could have you could have cardboard cutouts of people in the place of the actors, and it wouldn't change the movie for the most part. Um, but I like that there's certain interesting ideas at the end of the film that make you think. Let's put it that way, and that's what always. 
as a kid, I always thought, yeah, yeah, I guess this is sort of like a fantasy film, not science fiction, but like one of the things that also stuck out in my head while watching this, even at a young age, is that I knew that that was Yvette Mamo in 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 the role, the 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 Doctor Kate in this. Um, she's, she's, uh, she's Mm -hmm. Weena from, from the time machine, from the original time machine. Oh, right. Yeah. I I know I recognized her. I loved her in the original time machine. She had just turned 18 while filming the original time machine to tell you how, how young she was in that film. But like, I, I recognized her and I recognized her voice even as a kid because I loved the original time machine. Um, but Beyond that, like, yeah, I, I recognized Roddy McDowell, and later on I recognized Anthony Perkins that, that was in Psycho. He was in Psycho. But, um, the- yeah. <laughs> and well, and, and Maximilian Schell as, uh, as Dr. Reinhardt, I think, didn't he win like an Academy Award for Judgment at Nuremberg or something? Slip I just Pickens remember in this that too, name as a voice. Yeah, which, which is awesome. Yeah. I think he yeah. plays Bob. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bob, oh, go yeah. ahead. And and the you were saying about the sorry, sorry, just before I lose my train of thought, you were think saying about you know who the stars of this. You can remove pretty much all the actors. Well, you can remove most of the actors because the actual star of the movie is Vincent. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a the robot, robot in the medicine yeah. guy. So he's still, yeah, in he's the medicine the one that gets guy anything is done. The <laughs> other robot, Maximilian or whatever. And it, all the characters are there mm-hmm. to do is to just espouse like exposition that's all they're doing is exposition all the way through the movie Mm -hmm. and then you have like the spiritual journey to hell and then release through heaven at the end of the movie it is so weird i can't consider it a science fiction movie i just can't even now it's just not (laughs) there are parts about this there are parts in the script i actually kind of thought were somewhat interesting and i'm not going to call it good but i like now aaron since you're kind of our resident space expert here cygnus was that not one of the, the first sex? black holes actually discovered or is yeah. or uh, am I, yeah so i thought that was kind of cool i'm like all right there's something there i didn't like the idea how they're sitting near the event horizon of this thing they have this anti-gravity technology I was like yeah no um and I kind of liked the idea how all these other ships had gone missing and they're like, oh yeah, there was the Russians, the Chinese and every, all these other people were out looking for this uh, ship, the Cygnus, which is the one that's sitting outside the black hole. I'm like, that's kind of a neat little bit of setup for the world. It just never quite pays off the way that I want it to. I like the idea of Dr. Kate being a technopath. And the first time, the first time I'd ever seen that ability portrayed um, in media was actually the television show Heroes. Uh, Back in 2008 or nine, there was a character named Micah who was the uh, the son of one of the uh, other characters. And this kid could talk the technology. And I, I, I don't think I'd even seen that in the X-Men or like anything like that at uh, the time. I just, I'd never seen it. Babylon, like Babylon that. five is calling. <laughs> yeah. Again, I've only seen like part of the first season of that show, which that's another show we should really talk about at like some point. Um, but yeah, I, again, I thought some of the ideas in this were cool. Um, I loved the design of Vincent. I love the vocal performance by Roddy McDowell. Um, even Slim Pickens. Now that's a name I've known about for years, but I don't dude, know dude. a lot of their body Dr. strange work. love. So when I started researching this last night, oh my god, I've never seen it. Oh Want god. to? And and yeah. I mean, where you would have probably seen him, Mike, is when we reviewed Blazing Saddles. Oh, was, which one he, was he? He was the head of the uh, of the. the I guess outlaws that were run by the the uh, governor. He's the one that's in charge of every. Uh, I can't even say half of his dialogue <laughs> because it's so <laughs> offensive. <laughs> it's inappropriate. He's. Uh, I guess if you want to look it up at who he was, he's the guy in charge at the campfire scene where they're all farting. Oh, okay, yeah. Like I just had no idea, and I started reading about his history and his film roles. I'm thinking this guy's got a really interesting career, and I found. 
one of the things I really enjoyed about this movie is I love some of the sets in this. I love the robot design, but some of the soundtrack in this, like, cause I've got a pretty nice 5.1 surround sound system in my place. And I was listening to this with like Liam and like, cause I watched it with him and then I watched it by myself the, 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 the other night with like headphones on and again, there are some parts of the score I really enjoy. Um, yes, Alex, that's the book that I had. Um, yes, Alex, I, I sent a picture of uh, one of those uh, listen and read books that's uh, on like 33 and a third vinyl. Or is, it, or is it 45 for that one? That one was 33, yeah, because it, it was a small record. But yeah, um, I said there are parts about this are I really like two things that I noticed in this. I've, it was weird seeing Robert Forrester so young because I know Robert Forrester from heroes. I know him from, uh, I think it was El Camino. Maybe it was better call Saul. Maybe it was both of those, uh, two related projects and, and Jackie Brown is where I kind of know him from. And then, um, seeing Ernest Borgnine as a pseudo bad guy, or at least a coward was really interesting to me. And the other thing I really liked about this is how all the quote unquote robots are actually the lobotomized crew members that Dr. Reinhardt had turned into these cyborgs and they were just doing his bidding. And then at the end of the movie, when he's like, help me. And he's trapped under this piece of like kind of wreckage when the, when the sickness is starting to break up, they just kind of stand there and stare at him, deciding to not help him. What was that? Yeah. What was interesting to me was for a Disney movie that was clearly trying to, you know, they always market to kids or kids and families because the designs of the robots with the eyeballs and everything that everybody like, if you take the median age of all of the actors in this, it's like 50. There was like no young people for the kids to like attach to. So they made you try to attach to the robots that may or did or didn't work in some cases. Uh, the laser effects were kind of cool, but all the robots they were really did, sharp. They, they just didn't move. They just stood there and then would blow up and fall down. Like it was a shooting. The action in this boiled down to a shooting gallery. Yeah, it was very much like an arcade game where it was very like rotoscoped and for some reason Vincent is a crack shot that would put the Terminator to shame. Um yeah, the, funny the, in that the, scene, but they're like, We're the best robots in the world. It's like, then why were you replaced by these other robots? But they're apparently the best shot. But you know, my last final thoughts on this movie are is mm-hmm. it worth watching no maybe once? Maybe. Uh, like you said, it's 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 for fantasy there. This is a little bit more like a much more boring version of Masters of the Universe, if you're thinking of that kind of science fantasy. Um, uh, the best part of this movie for me, uh, outside of a few effects at the end when they're going through the portal, basic story, because we haven't even touched upon it, I'll just ramble yeah. through it very quickly, yeah. is a uh, crew of a ship goes out, they discover something near a black hole, they find it's a missing ship that's been missing for 20 years, one of the crew members on the current ship, her father was on that crew and she's like, well, we got to go find out what's going on there. They go there, they find a ship crewed only by robots. And then they find the uh, professor or the doctor who was kind of crazy, who turns out mutinied the, the ship or the, and killed uh, every single crew member, turned them into robot cyborgs. Uh, and then he is obsessed with finding out what's beyond life and beyond the universe. So he's going to go through the black hole and he wants them to monitor his, you know, trip through. They realize that the humans are being our slaves. So they want to save them with the help of one of the good robots that's left on the ship. And then they, uh, big mutiny thing happens. They, uh, start descending into the, into the black hole. The main crew, sort of escapes it looks like they escape or something or they pass through it uh the the robots decide not to help their their i guess enslaver (laughs) uh and he gets pulled into the black hole sees the infinite of the universe and whatever happens there somehow doesn't get ripped to pieces because there's absolutely no actual science applied in this movie whatsoever uh then they're passing through what looks like a bunch of weird tunnely things that look like the 2001 space odyssey and then you're left to wonder at the end did they 
come back into where they came from or did they end up on the other side of the black hole and the end yeah like i thought the ending was really weird and i remember because this is the first time i've seen the movie in its entirety i looked at liam when they went to the only way i I can describe it is robot hell i'm like what the fuck is going on i'm like what and when Reinhardt lives inside the shell of Max in eternal damnation, I'm thinking, okay, for a kid's movie, this is really fucked yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> and the best part of the movie for me, honestly, I really like their guns. I like those like twin blaster things where they have a blaster on the top of their hand and the, one on the bottom of their fist. So it's like very Star Lord. Yeah, I like that. And it does not would not surprise me if that's where Star Lord's design came from. I could believe that actually. Yeah. I mean, they're both Disney properties, right? So, yeah. Uh, But yeah, it's my final thoughts. I'm done with this movie. I never want to see it again. (laughs) I, if I had fuck you money, if I could get some of the collectibles from this movie, I would get the model kit for Vincent or Bob if I could. And I might look this up on YouTube later since Alex posted uh, the the Disney kind of read-along thing. I know some people archive that stuff and pop it up on YouTube. I would be very curious just to go back and listen to this. I think this is a movie, it's a reason why it's forgotten and not brought up in a lot of conversations. I don't know how well this did during its initial run in theaters, but this is something that almost never gets talked about or, like Alex said, it gets mentioned as the butt of a joke. I do think this movie could be remade with today's science and technology. Take some of the basic ideas from this movie. And I think you could do something really, really interesting with it, but it would need to be a lot more science based, but it also has to be a science that's based in accessibility where you're not just throwing terms at people like say a movie like interstellar or um, what was the movie? Something Atlas. Well, well, this, this was basically, that's what interstellar and, and uh, was it Atlas Shrugged? Not Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Struggle at, at Astra. Astra. Uh, at at Astra. Astra. That's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's basically what those movies are. We don't need a remake. <laughs> we got them and they're better. <laughs> I think I just want to see more Vincent. I would be very curious to see what a modern remake of Vincent's design might look like while still homaging this i don't know see i'm one of the guys who doesn't mind remakes every now and again when it's done proper like the thing the fly not everything's going to live up to those incredibly high standards but i think with the right director right script i think you could do something with this but you're right we do have interstellar we do have ad astra stuff like that so maybe you're right so, uh, Aaron, any closing thoughts from you on this? See, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm. It's not my. It's not my kind of movie. Um, even though it seems like it would be right up my alley, uh, and mainly because it's just incredibly boring for most of the run. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's it's a very hard watch, which is something for a Disney movie from around that time. I always found to be not something unusual. Like I found a lot of Disney movies became, were very hard to watch if they were live action before the mid 1980s. Maybe I'm alone in thinking this Uh, before flight, before flight of the navigator. It's yeah. Yeah, exactly. It just, it just wasn't fun to watch. And that's the thing. Like I'd watch it twice. Like, yeah, there's, uh, okay. Let me see. 1970 to 1983 is a rough period for Disney live action. Yeah. Okay. That, okay. Yeah, I think we can all kind of agree on that. So, yeah. so the, the, they, had, they had a lot of classic stuff before that. I'll say that, and, I, and I'll admit I can still watch a lot of their fifties and sixties movies. Yeah. So moving on to our next movie, this one was a pleasant fucking surprise. So this is a movie that Alex had picked out, and it stars Malcolm McDowell. And I can I will go on the record and say this is my favorite performance that he's ever done for me. And yet Uh, it's one of the only times he's ever played a good guy. Yeah. uh, So this is time after time. And this was, this movie had a really weird uh, history and how it got made. It's even had a television show in the last couple of years, which we were talking about this off air is terrible. I am pretty sure you could probably find all the episodes on YouTube, but I think you can find it streaming via like, 
the CW's website. I think, I think it's called CW Seed or something. Um, it supposedly sucks, so you probably just can skip that. It's, so it's Alex, just really not good. <laughs> yeah, so why don't you sum up the plot for this? Because this okay, is how um, you sold it to me. Yeah, a little background for me is I had seen bits and pieces of this. This I had seen, I think, the first half of this movie uh, years ago as a kid. And I thought it was like a fever dream, but I realized it was actually on TVO's uh, Saturday Night at the Movies. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I, I just blocked it out or didn't see the rest of it and then i had heard over the years that it was really good and i was like you know what? let's let's get this one to watch so time after time and how i sold it to michael it's it's i didn't sell it to you really it's it's the basic premise is what if hg wells actually did build the time machine and and what if he had to go into the future almost 100 years to stop jack the ripper and the idea was well you in history, Jack the Ripper just stopped murdering people, you know, just disappeared and was never caught. Well, what if it's because he moved forward in time and H.G. Wells had to chase after him? And that's the basic premise. And then, you know, the the real selling feature is you're like Malcolm McDowell playing a good guy. And you're like, and, who, and who's playing Jack the Ripper? David Warner? Oh, sweet God. <laughs> you know, you've got like one of the most charismatic guys to play a villain ever and then you've got it's basically guys who are usually known for playing villains yeah. playing off each other yeah like it was such a delightful interplay like david warner my first experience to him was the teenage mutant ninja turtles 2 secret of the ooze but he did another movie a year later and it was brian yunza's uh necronomicon book of the dead and he plays um, a scientist who cannot go outside. He's basically, he has to kill people for their spinal fluid to keep himself alive. So he can never uh, go outside. He can never touch someone. He can never know human warmth and touch. And eventually he falls in love with someone. Terrible stuff happens. And it's just a heartbreaking performance. And I'd seen David Warner do some stuff on Batman, the animated series, if I'm not mistaken. I think he did a voice on there. But this is one of the few roles where he chews the scenery, but he's so menacing and threatening as this distinguished English gentleman. And there's one line he says in this right towards the end, and he's playing up and he's fighting uh, uh, against H.G. Uh, Wells. And he's like, I've played chess with you for years and you should have learned one thing about me. And H.G. Wells is like, what's that? I'm no gentleman. And it was just like, fuck yes, I love this. That like, <laughs> that literally, I'm like, this is one of my f new favorite movies I've discovered in 2024. I'm so glad you showed this to me. My experience with him, I, I had obviously seen him in the Star Trek movies at some point, but didn't realize it was him under the makeup. Um, especially with Chancellor Gorkin, right? Um, and obviously uh, other appearances in Star Trek and TV shows, he was Ra's al Ghul in, in the Batman animated show, where I saw him first, and I remember him first, and I'm a little ashamed of it, <laughs> is uh, I remember him in Wing Commander, wow. the, the movie. <laughs> really? Who was he in Wing Commander? He's the Admiral. Oh shit! Man, I was about <laughs> that movie since I saw it in theaters. And you see, I, I I also didn't know that that was a game wow, series wow. before okay. watching now the movie. I feel, right? so, I feel even older now. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. I, 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 but I'll give I'll give that movie one thing. It introduced me to that game series. So yes, I'm happy for that at least. But that's where I remember him from first, and I was like, oh. And then I mistakenly thought he was Ivan Ooze in Power Rangers, but that's a different actor. <laughs> yes. uh, and, but I, and, but in reality, I then I went back and realized he was in a lot of things. Uh, but it was weird. This is probably the earliest movie I've seen him in. Both like I was going to say both of them. It's like no, no, no. I've seen Clockwork Orange, so I've seen McDowell in earlier movies. But uh, this was probably the earliest movie I saw. Uh, David Warner in, and um, this is also probably the earliest yeah. I've seen mm -hmm. Mary Steenburgen in a movie, right? She was quite young in this, and uh, the basic premise, like we said, is H.G. Uh, Wells has uh, invited his, I guess, friends, friends of, over? His, his high-class, high-brow friends in, in high society over to show them that he's invented a time machine that power, harnesses the power of the sun, even though it's in a basement with no skylight, <laughs> to to time travel. And it introduces some things that, you know, for a movie that's 
light on the hard sci-fi and a little more on the fantasy end of it. It has some logic all to its own. It sets itself up properly. He has a time crystal-y thing that allows for the time travel. He has a key that can uh, lock out the machine uh, separating you from the machine when you're time traveling. Um, and that's why the machine returned to its time period by itself because he had the key. Uh, they set up the idea that if you pull out the time crystal thing while you're inside of it, you'll be ripped from time itself and, and spread across the universe or whatever. Uh, and they uh, smartly move the, the, the time travel goes to the modern day. They didn't have to go into the future to deal with like any props or anything. And so they were able to save a fair bit of money on the actual film, but uh, you know, it shows smartly the, the perspective of Jack the Ripper, how he's, you know, slaying the women from a first person perspective, which had been done before, but it's done pretty effectively here. Uh, it, you're, you're with the audience pretty much know who Jack the Ripper is immediately because it's, it's not really trying to hide it, but he travels into the future with, uh, I think it's 15 British pounds gets converted to 25 bucks. and doesn't realize that that doesn't mean anything anymore. 25, bu 25 bucks, you know, in, you know, 1979, you know, they, What's that going to get you? Like, yeah, maybe 15, a hotel 15 room pounds for the night? in the late 1800s um, would have actually been quite a bit of money. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure out, uh, looking it up online, uh, 15 pounds converted. That would be like if he went to the future with, uh, or if he went to 1979 yeah. with like three or four grand. You know, he, 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 he gathered all the money he could gather and he's like, you know, maybe this will get me through. I don't know how long it's going to take me. He, he just didn't understand what inflation would be like and how the British pound would be worth basically. Yeah. It's worth more, but like how, when everything moved from the gold standard, it changed things, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so he ends up there. And what I did like is they were very smart in how he reacts to modern day of the time. I'm saying in quotes, cause you know, 79 is not modern day to us anymore, but him going around, you know, he's mesmerized by the mm -hmm. sight of an airplane by the, uh, uh, you know, he almost gets hit by a car because he doesn't know about streetlights and, and, you know, vehicles that everything was horse and buggy. You would have only seen some of the first steam, uh, steam cars and, 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 and gasoline cars would have been extremely rare, you know, it's prototypes at his time. He had one of the first electric lights in his basement. He said gifted to him by, uh, by Edison. Edison. Um, so he, he's a man of science who's not flabbergasted, but he is mesmerized. So he's not, he's not so out of his element. Like, I'm glad they didn't go the route of him panicking. Like he doesn't know what he's seeing. He's a scientific mind. So he sees this and you can see that the wheels are turning in his head where he's like, I see this. What is this? Oh, it must be this. And he's trying to figure out the science behind everything, like sitting down at like a McDonald's, uh, at a table and he's trying yeah. to figure out what and he's, he's taking notes through right? the like, movie. Like, like uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. 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 So he, he's like, I've never, I've never felt wood like this because it's not wood. <laughs> um, so he's that he's a little surprised at how easy it is to acquire weapons, um, which I think yeah. British people are still pretty surprised by how easy it is to acquire weapons in America. <laughs> um, but even more so back, you know, for somebody from his time period, uh, you know, he figures out immediately he's like, Oh, he goes, my, I was thrown, he goes, I'm, I'm off by the hour, like eight hours off on his time when he was time traveling. And then he sees that it's San Francisco and immediately it clicks. He's like, oh, there's the eight hour difference. So he's not a dummy. Like he, they didn't play him off to be the fool where he needs the modern day American to explain things to him. He is mm -hmm. somebody who figures it out as he goes. Um, and he's a little surprised by all the, the like porn theaters and stuff that he sees. Like he walks, by, <laughs> he walks by at one point or not, not him. It was Jack the Ripper walks by the the porn theaters and they're like big posters up they're playing deep throat all these other 70s movies and it's just like <laughs> he's like i'm home <laughs> when they have their when they have their big confrontation with each other he just shows them television yeah. and all the horrible shit that's happening in the 70s and and, and he's flipping through the channels and i'm like yeah it's not that different than now <laughs> and, yeah, and he actually and he, says something in that scene alex that i thought yeah. was so fucking chilling he's like hubert look at this this is not the utopia you thought it was going to be. Wars here, death, yeah. destruction, it's, and just you're right when he said, "I'm home." It yeah, was, he's like, he's, it's not your, it's it. not your world. It's not the world you want. It's yeah. basically my world now. And yeah. and he makes and he makes and he says he goes. Not only have they caught up to me, sure. they've surpassed me. Yeah, I'm an amateur here. 
like ah oh, my god i love yeah. david warner yeah so like that that part was great and then he meets uh the idea is he goes around trying to make some extra money he realizes that he can't he has no id to show or anything so he can't go to a rec to a proper dealer he has to go to cd pawn shops to make quick cash by selling his old jewelry um and they they when he does time travel i forgot to mention that he gets a little hurt so he doesn't see or hear all the things that are happening at that moment but you you hear through the time travel uh montage of, of special effects all the major uh events that happened that we have of, of recorded audio history so uh radio recordings and snippets from uh the advent of world war one all the way through hitler's speeches in world war ii uh, through, I think there's some the stuff moon about landing. Yeah. Moon landing and a bunch of that. And then when he's going around, like they made a big point of, you know, him, he's confused by certain things. Um, when he's with the, uh, jewelry dealer and the jewelry dealer is like giving him a quote on things. He looks and he sees, uh, he sees his, uh, Jewish tattoo, like one of the Nazi tattoos, you know, for branding. And you can see like he has a puzzled look on his face. Like, why does somebody have markings on their arm like that and they don't push it they don't really go into questioning but they made a point of, of showing it on the screen for the audience to see like he's so out of he's out of his element not knowing what you know that's planting the seeds to show that he's still naive as to what the future became and and what crap people had to go through um so there's that there's a big confrontation where he is uh he, he meets up with Mary Steenburgen, who is working at a bank, who did the uh, the money transfers at, for uh, for Jack the Ripper, and she gets involved, and she's going to be murdered, and yada yada yada. He gets captured. Uh, he, as in H.G. Uh, Wells, gets captured by the police because they think he's a phony and he's he's got no ID. They think he's causing these murders, and through circumstances, he gets let go and. You know, in the end, Jack the Ripper gets, he's in his time travel machine. He's going to travel back in time. He looks out the window, sees that, uh, that HG Wells is going to pull out the time key thing. And he gives him a nod. Like, he's like, all right, I understand, you know, and he's, he knows he's going to die if it happens. He, and he just lets HG Wells kill him. He doesn't try to get out of the machine or anything. And he pulls out the cord and he gets somehow vaporized into space. And in my head, I believe that's how he gets put yeah. into Tron or something. <laughs> Um, yes, but that's how we ended up in Tron. Um, but then, you know, HG Wells is going to leave at the end and at the very last minute, uh, she ends up going with him and it, it gets canonically put in that she's the wife that he married in real life. And they wrote stories together and it explains why some of his books are more feminist and future leaning because she had knowledge of the future and could help shape it sort of thing. Uh, and I want to mention one last thing that I forgot before is they do a, some of the smart, you know, some of the clever time travel -y stuff when he's in the museum where he in, comes out of when he travels future in time because, you know, he shifted the, the time machine. You basically end up wherever the time machine is. And the reason he shifted to San Francisco is they found his time machine while unearthing some old, you know, ruins, basically his old house. And they, they ended up having it sent on loan to the museum there. And he comes out and it's recreated sort of his study room. And his glasses are broken, and he's like, huh. And he goes into his study drawer, and he's like, well, there's a pair of my other glasses. So he just picks up one of his other glasses and puts them on. So they use, like, some basic time travel logic. It's like, well, they wouldn't be using replicas if it's his real stuff. He could just use his other glasses. And they have some pictures of actual H.G. Wells, and then behind him at one point, it's a picture of H.G. Wells at his age um, where that Malcolm McDowell is. So it's a picture of Malcolm McDowell. So there's some clever stuff in the background there. And uh, I really enjoyed the movie. It's not... This is... Best way I can describe this is this is a time travel movie yeah, that your I, mom I, can like. I watched this as <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I watched this as super excited. So I mean, this is this is likely my first exposure to all of these actors and actresses. And I remember watching this with my parents all the time it, it, because the violence that's on screen isn't really on screen. And so, it, no, there's blood, but it's never shown. It's uh, yeah, there, there is, is a severed hand, but it's not. But it's never. Um, it's not like it's oozing blood. It's on the ground. There's blood around it. You see blood, like you see, like a flash of it hit something. You hear a sound effect, but it's not even like a gargling sound of it. They 
used a sound effect in place of what would normally be somebody choking on blood. And it suits it better to keep it down to yes. that rated PG rating. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of trivia for this movie. Thank you to Wikipedia for providing this. Now, the role that um, David Warner played, the they originally wanted Mick Jagger for that role. <laughs> Fuck no. He would have been um, too dance. He would have been dancing the whole time. <laughs> now, according to this, I'm actually just going to read this because this is fucking fascinating. So, well, while preparing to portray Wells, McDowell obtained a copy of a 78 RPM recording of Wells speaking. McDowell was, quote, absolutely horrified to hear that Wells spoke in a high-pitched, squeaky voice with a pronounced Southeast London accent, which McDowell felt would have resulted in unintentional humor if he tried to mimic it for the film. McDowell abandoned any attempt to create Wells' authentic speaking voice and preferred a more, quote, dignified style, which... I think that's part of the reason why I really enjoy the performance from McDowell. Like there's something about the way that he portrays it, Wells where it's because he's doing the que the Queens uh London English versus a dialect outside of what you would consider to be high class. Yeah, like it's th there's just something about this. Like honestly, I've seen a number of McDowell's roles and some of them you can tell, "Hey, I'm going to do this for a car payment." And other times you get some really fantastic stuff. And I'm not the biggest fan of Clockwork Orange. It's fine. This is my favorite McDowell movie I've ever seen. Like, there's what? just something about this. It's so charming. What, not, like, not Star Trek Generations? <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm out of time, Captain. No. Like, the thing I, I liked, and you just said, this is a time travel movie that you can watch with your mom. You, you can watch and, this with your grandma and she won't be lost. Yeah. And seeing Mary Steenberg, she plays almost the exact same role in back to the future three. And she was actually quoted as saying, it's funny how I've played almost the same role, like almost a decade or more apart because she plays a woman who meets a time traveler and she falls in love with them throws them out of her life when she discovers the truth and then eventually goes back with them to their future and or past. And that's how it just kind of yeah, works out. For her. It's just, it just flipped this time you know, this, this movie, she's the girl with all the knowledge from the future. And then she plays the future looking girl in or future facing girl in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, back to the future three. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, the only thing I found problematic about this, and it's only just because this movie was made in 1978. Um, some of the dialogue at one point, uh, Mary's in the bank talking to one of her coworkers about HD. Well, she's like, Oh, he's so nice. He's so nice looking. I'm going to go ask him out. I'm glad he's not gay. Okay. <laughs> and then the next slide, she uses a very derogatory term for a lesbian. And she's well, I like sex and sometimes I get lonely, but don't worry. I'm not one of those insert slur here. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> but then I forgot 1978, 1978, re regular, regular PG movie dialogue, 1978. <laughs> yeah, I was like, holy crap. You can say that, I, but well, I mean, other than this, that, this is also a movie that's, you know, gets rated PG and they're walking by all the porn theaters and and you have guys try to pimp out prostitutes can i it, mention it is can what I mention it is that this is a nicholas a, meyer yeah. film yeah oh, and uh, he first, got the job it? because he wrote a sub the seven percent solution which was one of the best non conan doyle sherlock holmes stories i don't know if, if you ever mm -hmm. Oh, I have to. I've heard. I've heard of it. Yeah, I everyone, uh, I, I haven't when you mentioned like the seven percent solution, a lot of people assume it's part of the canon, but it isn't. Um, but Nicholas Meyer, yeah, of Star Trek Two fame and all that, yeah. And so that, that explains a fair bit. I mean, and he, I mean, after that, he's done. I, I know he's. We know him for directing, but I think he's primarily known for yeah. writing scripts mostly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. I mean, to look at this, like I m mentioned off the top of this segment, so this movie did inspire a ABC television series or something in 2017. It 
they made 13 episodes in America. They only broadcast five before it was canceled. It was broadcast in international markets. And I think it's available streaming somewhere out there. I got my information off of Wikipedia, but something like this, I'm almost assured that it survives on YouTube or somewhere. But this is a movie I do not think they should ever remake. The performances are pitch perfect, other than a few little bits of dialogue here and there. It's just, it's so accessible. It's a great 70s movie that doesn't Mm -hmm. overwhelm you that it's in the 1970s. It Mm -hmm. adds to the atmosphere of it. It's just, it's such a fucking delight. And... Like I said, I, I'm like I like I'm literally gushing over this. Like I was really tempted just to write you guys like a novel last night in our little kind of group no, chat. How much film. I yeah. enjoyed this, but not, yeah, like seriously, this is it's, probably my favorite movie I've seen this year. And I think the big deal with it for you, Michael, probably is that you went this long without seeing it and realizing that it should probably be amongst your list of you know, best eighties movies. The reason you probably didn't see it is it didn't come out in the eighties, right? It feels yeah. much more like an early eighties movie than it does a seventies movie. Yeah. Like it's, it's got the right sense of adventure, fun, menace and mystery. And with those two performances by, um, Warner and McDowell, you just, you've got the perfect, recipe for such an engaging movie and i really hope you guys check this movie out like it is such a thrill i don't know if it's streaming anywhere i would presume so um probably readily available to buy physically but uh no seriously freaking see this movie you will not be disappointed Um, so I guess that's pretty much going to bring this edition of future imperfect to its conclusion. Like I said, hopefully you guys will check out at least one of the two movies we have uh, talked about today. If you want to watch the black hole, pretty sure that's still available on Disney plus right now. Um, I think it's worth watching once. It's got some interesting ideas overall, Eh. uh, but time after time I gushed about it for the last five minutes. So go watch it um so next time on the show we're gonna take probably take a look at more stuff that alex just pulls off his dvd shelf and just loans to me and uh i'm perfectly fine with that because now i'm learning and now we've talked about planet of the apes for a few minutes i guess i know that's available on disney plus so maybe that's something we should probably do at some point um so yeah i guess that's going to do it for this edition of future imperfect so to uh take us back to the 1800s we have been Alex the producer. I'm Aaron Pollier. And I've been Mike the Birdman saying, live long and prosper. Computer, this is Captain James Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Destruct sequence one, code one, one A. Computer, initiate the self destruct sequence. Authorization Janeway Pi 110. Computer, this is Captain Benjamin Sisko. Initiate auto destruct sequence. Authorization Cisco Alpha 1 Alpha. In auto destruct sequence, authorization Picard 47 Alpha Tango. Self destruct in 15 minutes. There will be no further audio warning. My lord, the ship appears to be deserted. How can that be? They're hiding. Yes, sir. But the bridge seems to be run by computer. It is the only thing speaking. Speaking? Let me hear. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Get out!